Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, do I need uh, the microphone? No. Nah. No? Okay. Good. Good. Hi. So, um, Neurosave is a clinical stage uh, therapeutic company dedicated to reducing brain injury from a number of different sources, such as surgery, cardiac arrest, stroke, traumatic brain injury. We're focusing currently on stroke. It's the number two cause of death in the world, which I found kind of surprising, actually. Um, the average lifetime cost of a stroke in the US is about $140,000. 87% of that is after the first 30 days. So that's after the hospitalization, after the acute rehab. Um, I affectionately, well, I, it, it's a lot of uh, just dealing with it and not actually making anyone better. There is a therapy that you probably have heard of uh, that's come out about 15 years ago or so. It's become much more exciting within the last five years, and it's mechanical clot removal of the clot that's actually causing the stroke. And I'm using that as an example of, of the excitement and the need uh, for new stroke treatments. Uh, the cost per quality adjusted life year in that, for that therapy is negative 25,000 pounds, meaning that if you don't do that therapy in a particular eligible patient, you're actually spending more money for the worst result. A negative quality is a very unusual thing. We're going for, a, we're going for something similar to that. Uh, and we believe that therapeutic hypothermia, uh, if delivered rapidly, potentially even before hospitalization or before this clot removing procedure, could dramatically change the stroke landscape. Mechanical clot removal is a big business so far. This is only at most going to treat about 20% of ischemic stroke patients in the US. Currently, about a quarter of those potential patients are being treated. One, it's a crowded market. One particular company I just wanted to point out is um, uh, located in uh, Alameda. It's called Penumbra. And they're valued at $5.4 billion. So this is, stroke is something that people are very interested in. As you can see from the column, it is a pretty crowded field with big names like Stryker and um, Medtronic uh, well in the space. The problem is not only are 80% of the strokes not treatable with this mechanical uh, embolectomy at this point, but even when we do it, we're only doing it on very big strokes and they still have bad outcomes. So uh, I'm assuming most don't know this um, functional stroke scale called the modified Rankin score. Uh, but zero is normal, essentially, after a stroke, and six is dead. And everything else is somewhere in the middle. A good outcome is generally defined as a zero or a one. And a bad outcome is pretty much anything else. These mechanical embolectomy devices well, they can triple the number of people who have a good outcome. If you look at the bottom, I'm going to use this one instead of that one because that one looks a little fuzzier. Um, if you look at uh, this one particular trial called Mr. Clean out of Europe, the control arm had only 6% with that good outcome without having the mechanical embolectomy. None of them were a zero. This was the intervention arm of their randomized controlled trial, and this is the newest data. This is 1,400 patients um, in a registry that was just published this year. You can see that 19% uh, have a good outcome. A bad outcome, however, could be defined as a five or a six. Most fives would probably want to be a six at this point. Five is a very, very bad outcome. One-third of all patients 
have this bad outcome in the control group and in the registry. More people die than have a good outcome in a crowded business where one of the actors is worth $5 billion on the open market. That's an indication of the size of the problem. So what could we do about that? Well, it turns out that if you cool in animal models of stroke, you can reduce the size of the stroke and you can improve the outcomes from the stroke. There are so many animal models of stroke that they have a meta-analysis. They actually have two meta-analyses of animal models. I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, thousands of animals, a hundred trials, and basically they found some pretty non-shocking things. Earlier, faster, and deeper cooling was more effective. However, what you might find shocking is that currently we don't do early, faster, or deeper cooling. And we'll get to that in a second. In one particular trial or set of trials that, uh, that I, I really want to focus on, they looked at primates, they looked at baboons. And even after they clamped an artery for one hour, released it an hour later, you would have at normal body temperature an infarct of 35%. That is mimicking the best outcome that these clot retrievers could ever get. And that's only one hour. Most people don't even come into the emergency room within that first hour. However, if you, an hour and a half after you release the blood flow, you cooled that animal deeply, the brain anyway, deeply, down to 26 degrees Celsius. And this was done at a decade ago at Columbia University, you could reduce 98% of the infarct. The implication of data like this is that cooling could be more effective than mechanical embolectomy itself, and certainly could be applied in a much greater, much larger population than mechanical embolectomy could. Even in baboons, again, same uh, group from Columbia did a different study, only going down to 32 degrees Celsius and only cooling for six hours, again, starting an hour and a half after the blood flow was completely restored, they showed smaller strokes by MRI compared to a control group, better function, and more self-sufficiency. Faster cooling is critical. Time is brain. There's a meta-analysis of cooling after cardiac arrest, which is in some ways an excellent complete reperfusion model. And this is in, in humans. They looked at 13 cardiac arrest trials, almost 5,000 patients. They found that if you were cooling at a particularly fast rate, you did better. If you got to goal temperature within a certain amount of time, you got better. The concept of having a therapeutic window shouldn't be surprising to anyone in healthcare. However, what is surprising, to me anyway, is that large clinical trials of cooling for cardiac arrest, for example, took 10 hours to get the goal temperature, 12, 16 hours. And these get published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then people go scratching their heads saying, well, God, it works in animals, but it doesn't seem to work in people. And it's either that Every animal that they've ever tested, including non-human primates, are so drastically biologically different from us that cooling will never work for, that, for us. Or maybe we're applying the cooling in humans differently than we were applying it in these animal models. And that indeed is the case. In an animal model, everything is controlled and you can start cooling pretty much right away. And most of these studies didn't delay very much at all in the animal lab. I'll get to how we do this in a second, but NeuroSafe cools the brain a lot faster. If you look at systemic technologies to cool the brain, they also cool the rest of you. And that takes time, sometimes a lot of time. 
And sometimes the body shivers and fights against this cooling. We are focusing cooling up into the brain. We're actually allowing the body to stay warmer. Sometimes you could even keep the body at a completely normal body temperature and still cool the brain to a therapeutic degree. We can cool the brain three degrees Celsius in 15 minutes, where invasive cooling catheters, Zola is a, a company that uh, some of you may have heard of, um, they have bought all of the different types of invasive venous total body cooling catheters on the market. Um, they, in really optimal uh, situation, can get to that three degree mark in two hours. Blankets, even the fanciest ones, get there in three hours. So how we do it, we circulate cold saline in the pharynx and the upper esophagus. The anatomy is incredibly fortuitous. These arteries are really close to this mucosal surface. And this mucosal surface you can get to through your nose and your mouth. You have to be intubated for this procedure because the endotracheal tube will prevent fluid from going into your lungs. As a pulmonologist, I know that these, that they work in, in that particular function. Um, we have another catheter that delivers fluid, oops, sorry about that, that delivers fluid into the mid-esophagus. We have a balloon in the stomach that prevents fluid from going that way. We have another pathway that goes from the nose to the mouth. These two flow paths have very different resistances. Therefore, that's why we're delivering at two different places, but we're actually sucking it back from the mouth for both of those pathways. Something this simple can be 10 times as effective as current market leaders. We did a clinical feasibility trial after a number of large, uh, large pigs, and we were at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Five patients having cardiac surgery were studied. We didn't cool the first three very much to lead in. The last two patients were cooled with water or saline that was chilled to approximately six degrees and then approximately two degrees. Now those are the settings at the heater chiller at the base unit. The actual fluid that gets delivered is a couple of degrees warmer. We measure brain temperature by uh, the blood temperature exiting the brain at what's called the jugular bulb, the very top of the jugular vein. The body temperature was traditionally measured with the bladder. There were no device safety issues at all and no hemodynamic or respiratory effects. Here is our fifth patient. You can see that we decrease the temperature in the brain very quickly, and we maintain a difference of about three and a half to four and a half degrees Celsius between the body and the brain. This shaded area here is a 32 to 34 range that's typical for use of hypothermia after cardiac arrest. Two minutes, sorry, okay. Interestingly, because we're cooling in this area here, if the blood flow slows to the brain, the blood residence time within our cooling zone increases, and we're actually able to suck out a lot more heat from the blood that's feeding the brain if your brain perfusion is lower. So this works better if you're sicker. This works better if you're, than if you're in shock. This, that I, as a critical care physician, have never seen before. In this particular patient, they had a little hiccup with the heart lung machine, and we had a three minute episode of cardiogenic shock. They were actually having to squeeze the heart mechanically to keep a mean arterial blood pressure of about 45, which is maybe half of what you would normally have anybody sitting around here now we were able to cool an extra four degrees Celsius in two minutes. And we just stopped because per protocol, if we got down below 30, 
we just turned it off. This has huge implications for things like cardiac arrest, especially in field treatment of cardiac arrest, because chest compressions are a lousy way to perfuse the brain. They work, but they don't work that great. If you were cooling while someone was getting chest compressions or if they were in cardiogenic shock after you brought them back, we would actually be more effective at cooling that person and more selectively cooling that person as well because the difference between the body and the brain widens. So in my minute left, um, I want to talk very briefly about how we're going to prove something that people will think is valuable. Okay, um, And it turns out that if we go back to stroke, we can look at infarct volume at day zero and at day three by MRI. And recent studies have been using an endpoint, the growth of the stroke over the first three days. It turns out that MRI generally underestimates at the beginning how big the stroke is going to be the effect peaks at three days and then starts to improve a bit. Every single patient that they've ever studied, that infarct has grown over three days, if they've looked at it. Even when they pluck the clot out effectively, it grows. It just doesn't grow as much. In our study, we're going to show something radically different. If we believe the baboons, if we believe the rats and the rabbits and the cats and the dogs and everything else and the pigs and the sheep that have been studied before, at three days, we should see a decrease in the size of the stroke. We should see a dramatic decrease in the size of the stroke. So we're going to latch on, basically, to patients who are getting reperfused, so we know that that's not a variable anymore. And we are going to hopefully show in a small group of patients who are acting as their own controls that we can radically shrink stroke. And if we do that, well, things are going to be OK. <laughs> um, and if we do that, we believe that our pivotal 200 patient trial is extremely likely to show the clinical benefit that FDA and CMS are looking for. Thank you. Nah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the time looking for the ice, okay, all right. Uh, so your skull is pretty, uh, um, not your skull, I'll say my skull. My skull is pretty thick, okay, so if we put something cold here, it, doesn't, it does not go through, all right. Not to mention you've got a completely different blood supply going to the scalp itself, so it's not like the blood goes to the scalp and then puncture, you know, goes through the skull into the brain. Otherwise, you'd be getting meningitis whenever you have a dandruff flip, right? And you scratch your head. So, um, no, no, so that would be taking the heat away, and then you've got this big, thick bone there. And yeah, so it, people have looked at it. The only time that, like, a cooling cap would work is if you're an infant and you don't have a fully developed skull. And they actually do it in, in, in birth anoxia, blue babies, yeah. And then the rest of it, I mean, why they, they do they they put ice packs in the groin, they put ice packs under under the armpits to try to cool the brain. Yeah. You gotta get through all this first. So is this a helpless to go through the ordinary ventilator or the Oh, the ventilator is independent of this. You just have to have that protection. You just have to have that airway protection. So so what we do is we are circulating, so we, we deliver the fluid here and here, we suck it out of the mouth, we send it over to a base unit that has a heater chiller, like from a heart-lung machine, and a single roller pump. Those are not part of our device. Our entire, our device is entirely single use. So hospitals don't need a capital equipment expenditure. Um, while we, while the, Fluid is outside of the body, it is getting cooled, filtered, and then pumped back in. So it wouldn't interfere with the breathing? No, well, so, so if you have the breathing tube in, then, it, then the 
the air is going through the inside of that tube. This is so, um, there, Lardal has um, a recessa annies. I don't know if anybody's ever taken a CPR or ACLS course, okay? Uh, you have to you know, do it on the mannequin. They have fancy mannequins that actually vomit for you, okay? All right. <laughs> So the endotracheal tube cuffs are designed to prevent vomitus and other things from entering the lungs. Um, and that's a, ha that's a lot more caustic than the, the cold saline that we're using now. In fact, FDA requires that any endotracheal tube manufacturer um, uh, do a particular test where they test against a five centimeter column of fluid. And then they have to test how much might go through in a, in a bench test.